Okay. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Mike, Mike Horowitz, and I'm here to present to you So You Want to Make a Video Game. It's just a quick workshop to get you to know what it means to make a game, what a game is, and the kind of tools that are out there, and just motivation to get you started. So with that, let's get started. Uh, I accidentally hit it before, but it's also known as, aka I played Undertale and I loved it, and now I want to make a game where skeletons get to make out like all the time. <laughs> Also, also known as Undertale, more like under stale, and to prove it, I'm going to make my own game that's going to be exactly like it, but, you know, better. <laughs> also, also, also known as Super Mario is pretty fun too, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> this is the kind of stuff that I'm going to be going over in my presentation. Uh, what's a game, the mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics, genres, tools of the trade, a couple tips and tricks, resources, and then questions afterwards. So with that... I got some good news, bad news, and some other news. Good news is, is that making a game is a lot easier than you think. There's so many tools and resources online available for you to use, and a lot of people that are really helpful in trying to get other people to make games. So there's plenty of stuff out there and a lot of stuff to get you going. The bad news is, is that it's still a lot harder than you think. It's, the tools are available and there's a lot of help and there's a lot of resources, but at the same time, you need to motivate yourself. You need to get in there and you need to actually make a game. That's the biggest hurdle, making a game, that's it. Once you get that done, you can make other games, but you'll have that one game down. So, with all that being said, it's still possible to make a game. The golden rule is to keep it simple. Very, very simple. Your first game doesn't have to be much. It could be a Pac-Man clone, but it doesn't have to have any ghosts. It could be a racing game where you just move across a vertical line or a horizontal line and there's no obstacles whatsoever, but as long as there's you know, a start state, an end goal, and a win condition, that's it. You're good. You don't have to do anything else because everyone starts off making a game super simple. There's not much to it usually. Same with drawing. You know, you got to start somewhere. And most of the time it's something like this instead of something, you know, by Michelangelo. It's, it's uh, not that easy to go in there and then pump out under Undertale in like your first go. Most of the time it takes a lot of years, a lot of practice, 50, 100, 200 games, little itty bitty things that no one ever sees before you actually do the thing that's amazing, that gets critically acclaimed, that wins you prizes and gets you boatloads of money, you know? Everyone loves boatloads of money, but they come later. So what is a game? Well, simply put, games enable experiences. Games are spaces where people can assume different roles, they can act out uh, different, uh, different, uh, different things and play together in a space that's basically specific to a game. So if you're playing tag and you get aggressive with your fellow teammates, but outside of tag you're just the nicest person ever, well it's in that game that you're allowed to be that person. So it lets you gain those experiences, it lets you live through them, but also uh, it's interactive and that's what differs it from other mediums, is that it's a lot about interacting with the system, interacting with other players, and living off of those experiences. Another uh, more uh, academic definition is games are an exercise of voluntary control systems in which there is a contest between powers confined by rules in order to produce a disequilibrial outcome. <coughs> so simply put, games are an exercise of voluntary control systems. That means we're engaging with the game. We're not being forced to do it. It's not something that we have no say over. It's something that our actions uh, affect the outcome of that system in which there is a contest between powers. Sometimes it's us versus other players. Sometimes it's us versus a computer and artificial intelligence. Other times it's just us versus ourselves. Uh, confined by rules. So these are the rules that the game sets up. Where uh, in Mario Kart, you know, you can drive straight on the track, but you can't drive backwards and you know, beat everyone else by going backwards through the, the course. It doesn't work like that. You have to go the right way. Um, uh, in order to produce a disequilibrial outcome. So where you are a winner and someone else isn't. Basically, that's what it is. So that's just simplifying all that, but there are so many different ways to define games that you can look up online and find like 50 different ones. So here's another one. Uh, I forget who quoted it, but it's from a book. Uh, a game is a problem-solving activity approached with a playful attitude. That's it. Simple. Easy. So a game can really differ a lot from what we expect it to be. You know, it could be Pong, where it's just basically focusing on mechanics. You're moving two paddles, you're bouncing a ball around, you're getting points, to a game like Proteus, where there is no real win state. 
you're walking around, you're experiencing what the island has to offer, everything is musical and you can explore, and it's more based on your own experiences and the way you play the game, what you get out of it, more than it is on getting the most points or being the most, uh, most skillful at it. So there's a lot of different variations on what is a game, and even games outside of video games, you know? Charades, choose your own adventure games, tag, go fish, solitaire, hide and seek, board games, card games, uh, taking a piece of paper and making silly drawings with the other person. You know, it's, it's confined by a set of rules, and in that space you're able to assume different roles and act out different things, but it's still resulting in a playful attitude. It's still resulting in, in a fun outcome. So games can be defined other than just what we think of as video games. So this is something developed by uh, three game designers, Robin Henneke, Mark LeBlanc, and Robert Zubek. It's just kind of a framework that allows us to more easily think about and explain how games are made and the underlying structure of them. So this is basically showing you from the developer side to the player side. The developer works mostly with rules. They're the ones who say, okay, there is a 5% chance that you'll acquire this power up and a 7% chance if you acquire that power up, but it'll only happen if this happens, uh, and it's mostly just like logic statements and uh, acts of randomness and uh, just other numerical factors that they have to deal with in order to create the experience that they want. For the players, they don't see all that. They don't have to deal with the percentages or the numbers or the integers or all those values. What they see is the fun part of it, you know, the, the flashy stuff, the visual stuff, you know, the stuff that gets them talking to other people while playing the game or talking to other people who haven't played the game. That's the kind of stuff that they deal with. And in the middle, right in between the, the, the abstract rules and the more concrete fun that the players have are the systems. This is the way that the rules interact with each other and interact with the players to create different outcomes and different uh, experiences. So what they've done is they've taken these three uh, pillars, rule systems, and fun, and divide it into mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics as a simple, easy to understand way to kind of split up what all that means. So we'll just dive in a little quickly. I'll give you the definition from the, uh, from the research that they did. So they describe mechanics as the particular components of the game at the level of data represent representation and algorithms. Dynamics is the runtime behavior of the mechanics acting on player inputs and each other's outputs over time. So this is the way that things interact with each other, how you might have uh, two players with a power-up and the way that they interact with those power-ups, it could change the way that the game is played or it creates an outcome that's unexpected when you're working just with the numbers. And finally, for aesthetics, uh, it describes the desirable emotional responses evoked in the player when she interacts with the game system, he or she. Um, this is just everything that we see visually, everything that we get um, viscerally from the game. The story, the characters, visuals, sound, music, all that stuff, that's the stuff that the players pick up on because it's so immediate, it's so surface level for us. And just to go in a little bit further on dynamics, uh, this is uh, Marco Blanc on Kama Sutra. He's saying that it's about the behavior of the game as a system. You know, what happens when you play? What happens when you do this? What happens when you do that, given these rules? Uh, it's like a speed boost for the guy who's losing, you know, that's one way to think about it. The way that it, inter it interacts with the way that you play the game and certain things might come up. So the player is part of the system too, so some of our understanding of game dynamics has to be an understanding of human dynamics. The way we play also affects the game too. So depending on how players interact with the game, certain experiences might be more tailored to an aggressive playthrough. Some may be more towards a pacifist playthrough or a more fellowship uh, kind of uh, setting, you know, where you're just focused on the positive experiences and the friendship instead of the aggressive experiences. So there's different ways to structure a game and thinking about, you know, the mechanics and the dynamics can help you get the aesthetic results that you want. So this is kind of splitting it up so you can kind of get a good idea of what it means by the two of them. So mechanics are like hand-eye coordination, strategy, problem solving, risk reward, completion. While aesthetics is more along the lines of story, character, sensory, strange new things, immersion. Emotional versus more mechanical, you know, more uh, technical. Also have these slides up online after, so if you want you can 
go through it. I have links uh, included in there too for other articles and websites for you to check out. So don't worry if you don't catch everything. So now I just want to talk to you about genres. So as we know from film genres, there's a lot of different options here. And it also tells us a lot about the movie itself. You know, uh, it's, it's often you hear someone say, oh, I'm in the mood for an action movie tonight, or oh, I, I want to watch a good horror movie tonight, you know? Because they want that kind of emotional, emotional visceral experience. That's the kind of thing that they want. However, for games, for one reason or other, the genre is actually from a mechanical standpoint more than it is from emotional standpoints. You know, we talk about a platform because it's confined by the rules where it's working in a 2D space, you're moving left to right usually, and it's focusing on jumping and, and running. So it's more about that except for, I think, maybe survival or sometimes horror gets thrown in as a game genre. But most of the time you're focusing on the mechanics of that game. So when you say you want to make a fighting game, that's a very skill-based game that's usually coming down to timing. It's two people uh, trying to read each other in a very complex game of rock, paper, scissors, you know? I would argue, too, that RPG kind of lost its meaning. Like, at first it kind of meant, you know, uh, first person, kind of Final Fantasy style, but mm -hmm. now, like, RPG elements are kind of side elements that are also in shooters and mm -hmm. other games. Yeah, you see that a lot with roguelikes these days also. Uh, a lot of people are assuming uh, roguelike tendencies original, originating from a game that may have nothing to do with the modern equivalent of what we see today, but because of the way it's been passed around and associated with other games, it kind of takes on these roguelike-like elements or roguelite or whatever you know other connotation they may adopt. So game genres, I just wanted to explain to you that it comes from a mechanic standpoint more than it does an emotional standpoint. So, yeah. It's okay to step outside the box, though, when you're working within game genres. Because although you're making a platformer, it doesn't have to resemble Mario. It could more resemble, you know, Friday the 13th, uh, the movie, if you wanted it to. You know, you can make uh, a shooter, but one that uh, works closer to, like, a Disney film, for some reason, if you were so inclined. You know, you have a lot of different options to work within the constraints of the mechanics because the aesthetic side of it, the emotional side of it, is completely up to you. You know, just because you're making a survival game doesn't mean it has to be stressful. So, in deciding which genre you want to try your hands at, which one you want to dive into, it's all about asking yourself which one you're most passionate about. Okay? Which one do you enjoy playing? Which one are you naturally drawn to? Do you really like uh, text adventure games because it's the thrill of imagining everything within your head and you can just go in there and do whatever you want and test the game to see what you can or can't look at or poke at? Uh, do you like RPGs because of the characters and the grand storylines or the way that you can personalize your character and the stats and everything? Or do you just like platformers, or party games, or action games, racing games, you know? There's so many different options, and naturally we are drawn to certain genres over others. We're drawn to certain experiences. So, also decide which one makes best use of your knowledge base and skills. Yeah, sure, you want to make a first-person shooter, but you're only really good at small little 2D animations, so how would that translate into a 3D space? Maybe that's not the best idea. You know, you like drawing people from the side, so maybe a top-down RPG is the best idea. Let's try something a little 2D, a little flatter from a, from a, just a eye-level plane, you know? So try and look at, understand what you're good at, what you enjoy doing, and work within those constraints because you're still able to get a lot out of that. There's still a lot of freedom even though you're defining a line, a border within which you'll work. So. Another way to think about this is which most effectively conveys the core of what your game is about. So if you were to make a game about dealing with a recent breakup, how would the genre add to the message if it were a turn-based RPG or a stealth game? What if you wanted to talk about your breakup using a rhythm action puzzle game? You know, what would that say about the breakup? <coughs> There's different ways that the genre can uh, complement the emotional content, the aesthetics, and there's uh, other ways that it can't. Maybe it can't work that way. Maybe you can't really make a survival game 
that's not stressful because that's the point of survival games, you know? So it's about thinking that back and forth between what is, should this be the genre that it is or am I thinking of another genre? Should this, maybe I should do a different game if I want to do a platformer, you know? So there's different ways to think about it from the genre up or from the aesthetics down. So one way to think about it too, just to simplify and make it easy, uh, I want to make a genre game about theme where the main mechanic is verb in game engine. So I'm gonna talk to you about all the game engines later, but this is like a, just a very simple framework to get you thinking about the core of that game. You know, where you wanna start from, what you wanna do. So as an example, you know, I wanna make an RPG game about dinosaurs where the main mechanic is gambling in Game Maker. Why not? You could do it. <laughs> or I want to make a survival game about gods where the main mechanic is high-fiving in Twine. You could do that, <laughs> you know? You're only limited by your imagination, really, and the game engine, what it's capable of, but usually you can push that to its limits. It's pretty good. Uh, or a fighting game about cats where the main mechanic is being too cute in Construct 2, you know? Why not? <laughs> you can go all out, do whatever you want. So. I'll just walk you through a couple tools of the trade, just some, a lot of free tools. Some of them are uh, just limited licenses for the free version, so you're only able to export maybe for web, or you're, you don't have as many assets that you can use within the game, but they're still free. You can still play around with it, and the price of it, usually game engines can cost around, uh, I think like between 50 and 100, depending on which version you're getting, who's selling it, how many features, what it's for. So let's just take a step through it. Uh, this is basically what you want to look at when you're starting a game. You know, uh, there's a link in the uh, slides too, so you can feel free to check it out. You know, do you want to do 3D? Do you want to do 2D? Do you want to do text-based? But you have so many different options for doing things that it, it shouldn't be an issue finding one that you're comfortable with. There's always alternatives. There's always other competitors who have similar products you can try out because it's up there for free too. Why not? So figure out what kind of game you want to make. You want to make a 3D game, you want to make a 2D game, text-based. There's different engines that provide different benefits depending on what you want to do. And they're all out there with plenty of documentation, plenty of how-to videos, tutorials, forums, FAQs, you name it. And are you comfortable with coding? Would you be okay learning a little bit of code? Do you want to pick a what you see is what you get kind of editor where you just kind of drag and drop these blocks that connect and you can easily see, visualize, uh, what the character should be doing and how to control it and whatever what's happening or would you be okay with like a little bit of programming or you know going deeper in some cases where the what you see is what you get editor isn't giving you what you want or do you want to go all the way to like C sharp JavaScript you know that kind of like real coding it it's a lot easier than you think and understanding the principles of coding is pretty simple if you want to get into it it just takes time and you need to be dedicated to it that's it but in the meantime, those what you see is what you get editors, amazing. So Stencil is one such uh, program that you can use. It's pretty good for 2D platformers and top-down games. Um, very easy drag and drop, you know. Uh, you don't need a lot of gaming experience or programming experience beforehand to kind of get in there. And there's plenty of uh, test games that you can go in there that lets you understand how everything works. and play around with all that. I mean, the biggest thing here is just to find a program, play around with it. If you're comfortable with it, go for it. You know, make a game with it. A lot of them are free, so it doesn't cost anything to download it, open it up, and find out that, wow, I really don't like the user interface of this one. I'm gonna close this one and go on to the next one. So Construct 2 is another one. Uh, this one is a little bit more robust. I was just wondering if a lot of these ones that you're gonna be reviewing are also for Mac as well, or Yes, yeah, I'd say 95% of them are Windows and Mac. Uh, there's one of them that's in a browser you can use, so it doesn't even matter if you're not on Windows or Mac. You can do it on your phone if you wanted to, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so uh, I, I had it in before, but I was rushing, and I couldn't look it up for the rest of them, so I just decided to get it out, because most of them were Windows and Mac, and I was looking it up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty good. Um, so yeah, so Construct 2 works kind of similarly. It's visual coding, so again, you're working with blocks, uh, but you can go a little bit deeper if you want to. It, it's 
very, very easy to get into. Like, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to be saying that a lot, but like if you wanted to, there's <coughs> forums, there's uh, tutorials, there's stuff you can check out just to even like learn a little bit like how to change the gravity in a way that you know the basic building blocks won't let you in inside the game engine. RPG Maker is pretty much what it says on the tin there. It's basically for making RPGs. If you wanted to make a rhythm game in that, I don't, I don't know how you do that, but good luck to you. Um, this is pretty much a go-to program for making RPGs if you want to start up because it's built specifically for that purpose. Uh, they have it uh, on Steam, I know. They have it online. It goes on sale. It's on the Humble Bundle sometimes, too. Uh, just keep an eye out, you know, because like, you can usually pick this up. I, I picked it up as part of a bundle. I think it cost me, like, what, 15 bucks, and I got two other game engines with it, so why not, you know? Uh, but, yeah, it's... You know, th this is the kind of thing you're into, like if you want to make something that's like a JRPG or an RPG or some kind of like big adventure game, you know, something like Final Fantasy or uh, um, anything else really. You, you have so many options and stuff to pick from, so don't worry about that. And there's different versions for this. This one's tricky because there's like RPG Maker VX, there's RPG Maker X, there's RPG Maker XP. So I've, I've put like $25 is for XP, that's like one of the older versions. And then they have other versions on top of that, and it's pretty confusing. But whichever one you pick, I mean, Do it's fine. Do you know fun. the difference, or it's just like updated? It's it's updated versions, but for some reason they keep it. I guess some people are just really dedicated to like the older versions, and they don't want to give them up. I can may, uh, answer a bit about that. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, XP, and I think was made in two thousand, I think. It's really like usually they try to copy a certain like Final Fantasy game, and uh, I guess XP would be like the first three or four, and then they just they just add more stuff, and then they for like the 2003 they changed the battle systems. If you kind of know RPGs a bit, mm -hmm. they went from the turn-based system to the ATB system, and then with the VX they changed it back, and now I think the latest version has the two of them, so we can switch between them. There's just like more stuff. Yeah. There's usually more. Um, there's usually more like base stuff too. So oh, yeah, I guess that was, I was yeah. just really wondering, just like if it was just adding, you know, like regular updates are, or if it's like <laughs> different like types. Yeah, and yeah, it's like it's that. it's different, but like whatever package you get, you can still make a game with it at the end of the day. You know, that that's that's not it's it's splitting hairs. You know, if you want to make a game, you can make a game with this. Another one is Adventure Game Studio. So, you know, the old school uh, DOS uh, point and click adventure games. You know, this is a program where you can pretty much make something like it. Uh, it's interesting. I tried my hands at it and it didn't go over so well. I got a little frustrated, but that's just me. Um, you can read up on it. There's documentation on this also. Uh, and it's pretty much one of the go to programs. So, there's a lot of people who are really, really dedicated to this who can help you out if you need help. Uh, there's a lot of people who also post their in-progress stuff, so you can see how they're doing, their, their videos on uh, developing it and everything. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so make some really fun games in there. And then there's Game Maker. So Game Maker is a pretty popular option. I mean, Nuclear Throne, Undertale, a bunch of other ones. Uh, Spelunky started off as a Game Maker game. You know, So you can make a wide variety of stuff. You know, you're not as limited with the other programs. And there is a drag and drop way to kind of create the game, but there's also the Game Maker programming language, GPL, if you want to jump in there and do some stuff yourself, you know, tweak it around. Um, you have a lot more options with that. Yeah? As animators, are we able to insert like uh, cinematics that we make ourselves and have them halfway through the game? Like when you beat a level, for instance? Like you can yeah, there, there's ways to erase animations uh, to. to uh, toss them together, you know, get all the assets in there and set it up. It's it's more about figuring out how to get the individual pieces in sometimes and it is making the entire thing because that's going to be too big and take up too much space sometimes compared to like creating a background and having your character automatically like move left to right and then like a victory confetti thing explodes in the middle of the screen, you know? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of the time there's, there's, you know, websites that tell you how to make the cutscenes and everything if you want to like make it like really cinematic and <laughs> engaging. <laughs> yeah, you'd have a lot of fun with that. So yeah, this one is a little bit more expensive. Yeah, yeah I was about to ask about the price, because it says yes. it's free. There is a free version that you can download. 
you're very limited in what you can do within it, but you can still look around, play around, see what it's all about, try it out for yourself. I think you're very limited in yeah, what you can export, uh, how many actors you can have in a scene, how many assets you can like bring into the actual program itself. So you can't have that many tiles, that many actors, that many scenes. You know, you're you're, you're a lot more limited in that respect. But it goes on sale, okay, a lot. Usually they have a flash sale. It'll go on for maybe I don't know, 40, 50, 60 bucks, and you can save a lot of money if this is the kind of thing that you're into. Why not go for it? Try it out. Won't hurt. So, but the the um, full version, you're able to like create the whole game. Yeah. Aspect. Yeah. Because well, well, you're able to make a game still in the free version. It just has to be a smaller game because you can't have that many assets in there. You know. Uh, well, whereas in the full game, you know, you can have multiple levels, maybe multiple enemies. You know, a whole bunch of different stuff happening at once. And you're able to export it also so that they can play it on the computer, on Mac or Windows, maybe on mobile. You know, you have a lot more options in that regard. But you can still make a game with the free version of Game Maker. That's that's yeah, still totally possible. And now we're moving on to like the more visual novel uh, text adventure kind of stuff, uh, dating simulator sometimes too. Uh, this one's called Renpy. Uh, it's a visual novel engine, and it has a very easy to, to learn scripting language. Um, you can kind of see here the way that it's set up. You know, <coughs> like show the editor button, which is a show editor button, and then you can just type in the, uh, the, the whatever dialogue should pop up and type in the options and the way that it can branch off. You can have a lot of fun with this too, and it's free and open source, so you know, you can make whatever kind of game you want. Uh, on the same note, there's visual novelty, which works the same way. It's, uh, it's more of a what you see is what you get editor than it is typing directly uh, like code to get it to work. Uh, but yeah, you have a lot of cool stuff you can make with that, and it's free too. Inform 7 is more for interactive fiction and stories. Less visuals, more words. You can hop around, uh, click on a word, and you're taken to like another passage where it describes a room that you just walked into. Or you click on the sword, and it describes a sword. And from there, you can go on in different directions. It's more choose your own adventure than it is a uh, visual novel. And Quest 2. So this is more like the text adventure games. You know, this is really, really, really going back. Um, and this one, you can make in your browser. You don't even, you can do it on any operating system. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on an iPad if you wanted to. You know, you can type it up if you know how. Uh, it just takes some getting used to to understand like the language and how it works. But you could have a lot of fun with this one. <coughs> and finally, there's Twine. Uh, this one's pretty easy to use and pretty simple, too. It's another open source option. Plenty of documentation, plenty of examples up there if you want. Plenty of people uh, willing to help out and giving tutorials and stuff. Uh, and very nice and easy to look at interface, understanding uh, how everything works and how to drag things around, connect stories in different parts. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff you can do with that one. And there's also Unity 3D. I do not recommend you jump into Unity 3D right away because this is a beast of a program. I mean, you can make games that can be you know, made for PlayStation 4 or Xbox One or Nintendo or PC or mobile, or you can make you know, silly little games. But <coughs> It's going to take a lot of programming know-how in order to get that done. It's not drag and drop. You have to understand how things work within this engine here, like how to drag things into the scene. It's also very, very terrible at animating. Very bad. Um, uh, I, I work at Kid Fox Games, and they, they're making the game in Unity. And just to try and get like a puppet created of like different parts is such a headache. I have, I have no idea how anyone gets anything done. Uh, in 2D in that one. That one's a, a mystery to me. It feels more like it's more dedicated to 3D and then they slapped on the 2D afterwards. So, yeah, but you can do 2D. Um, but if you were yeah. animating 3D, it's obviously fine. Like here, like for example, this scene right here, this is, they're, they're making a 2D game, but it's in a 3D space that they're building it, and that's the end result, flat on an isometric plane. So, 
you know, <laughs> you could do that in other programs too, but if you want more versatility, you want to be able to do more things. There's people that share things on the Unity Asset Store, so if you want to get like a special script for a camera to follow you around and to work with different events and stuff, you could do that, but this one is going to take a big, big jump. You know, you, re you need real dedication and understanding of programming in order to really get anything done in there. So the bottom view is like the, the final, mm -hmm. final output, and on top is what that is? Yeah, the scene. Like to move around, to look around, for programmers to look around. It's just an illusion yeah. because the camera is so far back that everything seems perfectly parallel. It flattens it out. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're making a 2D game right now, and it's just all on a flat plane, so we're not really doing much, but we're playing around with the Z layer sometimes if we need like stuff reordered on top of things. But like, I have this one character, this boss, at, at one point, like he does a slashing attack, so I had to get his arm going up there, and just trying to get it to overlap with the shoulder, just for that one frame. So hard. I don't even think it works it now, so if you play the game, you'll still notice it's there. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm showing you all these tools, I'm showing you what they can do and all, the, all your options, but all that's to say that it doesn't really matter what you pick at the end of the day. You know, the important thing is just making a game, you know, picking one, jumping in, trying it out, getting something out there, you know, that's it. Now I'll talk to you quickly about art and animation tools that work well with games. Um, I'm going to be showing you mostly like the 2D sprite stuff. So like if you want to make uh, small, you know, retro style games, you know, you want to work with 8-bit or 16-bit graphics or just really, really small scale, you can do that. So this is the one that I use. Uh, this is just a quick sprite sheet I made up. Um, so sprite sheets are just easy ways to condense all the visual information to a single file so that when the game runs, it can just pick between these two to get it to run. And then, oh, he's running the other way. Let's go between these two now. So it's just a way for it to kind of jump around within the same sheet. What this program lets me do, at least, um, it lets me get everything on one sprite sheet. I could work in layers. I can set up my grid. I can get animations going, different animations, on the same sprite sheet so I can switch between walking east, walking west, and seeing how it plays. There's a lot of limitations to this program, but at nine bucks I wasn't really complaining. So it gets stuff done, and I work in this more than I do Photoshop. In fact, uh, I say like 80% to 90% of the animations I did for the game uh, were in this. So you could get a lot done, but it just takes some getting used to, that's all. It's not so bad. There's also A Sprite. Uh, this one's more versatile, and they only had GIFs available, so sorry if it's distracting. Uh, but you could do a lot of that. Uh, you have a lot of options for animating, for uh, working with tiles, for exporting sprite sheets, exporting animations, a whole bunch of different stuff. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm mesmerized. All, all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And I just realized I forgot to change the text there. Okay. Skip. Same there too. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is another one, graphic scale. This one's more expensive. For some reason, it's only available in yen, and you need to uh, convert it to US dollars or Canadian currency. It was like $24 and something cents. I don't know what, but about $25. You don't have to use it. It's just another option out there. And Did you get it in Japanese? No, no, no. It's available in English, yeah. It's just from a Japanese seller. Uh, seller. So you could use Photoshop also. Uh, I included um, a link in the slide here to a script that lets you export sprite sheets if you have to. But at the same time, a lot of the programs you use, sometimes they don't necessarily need sprite sheets. Sometimes you can just take it from a GIF. You know, you can create a GIF of the animation, and then the program itself will be able to break apart the frames and say, OK, this is everything that we need. You know, it just depends. Take a look at the uh, program that you're using, find out what works with it, play around. Um, Photoshop is useful and, you know, we all use it, we're all used to it, so it's pretty easy to get into. Uh, working with animations I find is a little tough sometimes, but eh, you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. Uh, there's also TV Paint you can use, MS Paint if you want, GIMP, uh, Krita, I've heard of some good things about that too. Just use whatever you're comfortable with to draw art at the end of the day because we're artists, so 
we gotta find the tools that we like. Um, pretty sure Flash is pretty sure Flash exports to You could do Flash too, yeah, if, if you enjoy doing that. I was just, I, I popped all these in like 45 minutes ago maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's it, like at, at the end of the day, just find a tool you like, use it, jump around if you don't like, if you don't like it. Uh, don't spend too much money at first, just try your hands at different things. See what works, what doesn't, because if, if you pay 150 bucks for Game Maker, the professional edition, and find out, ooh, yeah, I can't do anything with this, well then there's $150 down the drain. So you're better off just trying out something, you know, seeing if it works for you. Maybe make a little game in there, you know, just a little something, you know, a guy walking across the screen or a, a spaceship moving from the bottom to the top, you know, not much. So keep the scope small and manageable. Your only goal is to finish a game. That's it. Get a game done. One game. And then you'll be able to say, I made a game. I did it. I made one. Look at it. It's great. Play it now. Play it. Seriously. Um, just got to finish one. Work with temporary art first. Pretty it up later. Don't spend a lot of time mm, animating this big final boss character with like eight arms and like two huge mega cannons like jutting out from the shoulders and like spikes in like every direction if you can't even get the character to move, you know. <laughs> it's, it's not worth it. You're wasting all your time on this beautiful art that can't even be enjoyed in the game properly because you didn't take the time to make sure everything works, that, you know, it's a decent experience, you know, that other people are playing it and go, oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's cool, I, I get that. You know, so you can work with temp art. Uh, a lot of the time we joke around about programmer art because sometimes they just take a block and put it in there or they'll use another asset that's already been done to, to just put as a placeholder. Uh, we're working on a, a boss, uh, Spirit Guardian, who's this big uh, wolf that walks on two legs and goes around uh, the arena to fight you. And at one point, one of the programmers just took an image of a camel and he got it to spin and put like a little like, <laughs> pow effect in the back of it <laughs> whenever he did like a spinning attack and I was like yeah sure no problem it tests fine and it works great so whenever it's ready I'll just replace the final animation that's it you know <laughs> yeah yeah he, he, he recorded a vine of it and I love it <laughs> so good uh, get feedback from other players this is the big thing compared to films is that we could work on films on our own and we can get feedback every now and then but games really rely on how other people play it. You know, it's about that experience, about that interactivity. And the only way you'll really be able to see if it works is if you get other people to try it out, to play it, you know. That's why you see those QA credits at the end of games that are like this long and they have like services here in Montreal where you sign up and you play test a whole bunch of games all day, every day, you know, and it's it's a job because people need to figure out what works, what doesn't oh, I didn't see that passage that leads you to the exit over there, so I was just bumping around in this area for like 50 whole minutes, and now I feel like my day is done. And, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's all about improving the player experience. So looking at how the player interacts with different things within the game, uh, maybe because the, uh, the other NPC in the game doesn't have like a big red health bar, maybe the player doesn't know that you can attack it, you know? visual signs, uh, little gameplay things that you can get in the game to kind of express certain things. Also, ask around online if you need help. There's so many different forums and options, and uh, there's uh, game jams, too, that take place for people who are just starting off making their first game. Uh, you can go there, get help, post a, on a message board, and track progress of your game, and if ever you need something, you can you know, ask around for uh, someone else to help you out, but there's so much documentation for all these game development programs and everything out there that it's easy that if you ever stumble upon something, chances are like 10 other people have stumbled onto the exact same thing and they offer like 50 different ways to go around it and figure out how to get past it. And also, you can really learn basic coding if you set your mind to it. There's websites like Khan Academy where you can sign up and play around with like just basics from programming languages and understanding how that works, uh, logic, uh, uh, you know, logic statements and Boolean operators and all that stuff. Just to, you know, get a feel for it, understand. You don't have to be able to code, but like understanding the like very, very basics of what it's about can help. You don't have to. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because uh, sometimes you're not going to be able to do things that the game wants you to do with the building blocks. So sometimes that might require you jumping in the game and tweaking a couple numbers or you know writing up a, a special uh, equation that lets you do the thing that you want to do. And finally, here's other resources. So I'm going to point you to Pixels. Uh, Pixels is a not-for-profit organization here in Montreal that's kind of designed from the ground up to get women developing games, to, to introduce game making to people outside of like the white male sector of what people normally think of as game developers. So it, you're, it, you know, it's open up to a lot of people also, but it's mainly designed for women and it's a safe space, it's open, they have a lot of resources there. If you're interested in trying it out, I know that actually, uh, I think it might be next Thursday, there's a play test it is. Uh, yeah, with uh, Grace. Yeah, uh, Grace, who's uh, graduating this year, right? Yeah. Yeah, she's graduating this year. She's part of an incubator program to make games, so it was a concentrated thing over like a course of six weeks, where a whole bunch of people who had never made a game before got into a room and started working on a game. So you can see the, their kind of first efforts and talk to them and figure out how their experiences went. Check that website for more info. Uh, Sorting Hat is a fun website where, uh, depending on what kind of game you want to make, it points you to the tools that you can use to, to make that game. So it's just a kind of personality test kind of thing where you just click, uh, I want to make an RPG, no I don't know programming, I like this. So here's the kind of tool that you should use for that. It's probably your best option. Uh, Extra Credits is a really educational and fun to watch video series where it's basically this one guy who's talking about uh, game development and what it all means and different aspects of it. You know, he has a series, uh, there's a series on there about making your first game. So in the beginner's guide to making a game, you can go up there and watch the videos and it gets you understanding more about the mechanics side of things, how to design a game, how to build a game, and the kind of other stuff that you can go out there and check out if you wanted to make it. Um, GDC Talks. They're very cool, very helpful, and very free, uh, some of them. There's a couple of them that are locked away in the archive that require like a $700 membership or something, but there's a lot of good free ones, and a lot of ones that also deal with animation. So if you're interested in animating for games, there's a couple talks in there that deal with you know what it means to animate for a fighting game. Uh, there's a really, really good one, actually, by Mario Cartwright, who's the lead animator in Skullgirls. So that was like a very traditional hand-drawn 2D animated fighting game that had very detailed and dedicated animation. So she goes through the process, what she learned through it and everything, and it's like an hour long, and you see a video of her and a video of the slides and get the audio, and it's free, you can check it out. It's really, really cool. And finally, Gamma Sutra. It's kind of a new site. It's uh, dedicated to just getting uh, game developers, artists, uh, from the business side of things, from the uh, more artistic side of things, just getting together and talking about games, about the industry, you know. Uh, there, there's going to be articles about uh, the artistic decisions behind designing the environment in The Witness, while also talking about uh, the best types of roguelikes over the last year and why they work and what it means to make good DLC, you know. You have a lot of different options and opinions and articles just talking about games. So it's a very, very helpful resource to check out. It was also my first game jam. Uh, that one was first held actually in January, and it was over the course of a month, but I think they're planning to do it again in the summer. So it's online, it's very, very laid back, very relaxed. You go on there, you make a game, there's helpful tidbits and then uh, people there willing to help out, kind of like mentors, and you're with a whole bunch of other people who are making their first game, so it's a good way to get motivated too. So keep an eye on that, just in case something happens in the summer. Uh, Pixel Prospector. It's a really, really cool site. They have very, very detailed guides going in depth about every aspect of game making. So if you wanted to make a game from scratch and you didn't really know where to begin or you want to brush up on your history or uh, just want to learn more about mechanics and what that means or the marketing side of things or the business side of things, you know, they have plenty of slides and videos and articles and stuff to check out. Uh, Tick Source is the indie game source. So a lot of the times, um, We'll hear about games being released, but we won't know where they came from or what's been going on. Uh, they have a forum on there where a lot of indie game developers have posted their progress. They've interacted with audiences. Fez started off as a forum post within TIG Source. 
uh, where over the course of the many, many years that it was being worked on, uh, there was progress shots and people were giving feedback and talking about games and understanding how things work and trying to explain what it's about, you know. So if you want to like dig deep a little into what it means to design a game and create a game, you can go ahead and check it out. And the Brainy Gamer podcast is an interesting podcast that I, uh, I listened to. I think it's done. They stopped posting uh, more episodes. But it's, he's basically a teacher who teaches uh, game writing and game design. And he talks to a whole bunch of people within the games industry, writers, uh, designers, uh, artists, uh, journalists, just talking about you know, different sides of making games. And uh, play games, you know? Play game, think critically about the game, be conscious of what's going on within the game that makes, that makes you do the things that you do within the game, you know? Think like a game designer. Nothing better than that. And uh, yeah. Do you remember what the, um, you know that Raul like did also like a game thing, right? Mm -hmm. That was for Critical Hit. Uh, okay. uh, Critical Hit is an organization that's run through the Tag Labs here at Concordia. And what it does is that every year they have like this, uh, this uh, summer program where they take on a whole bunch of different people from different uh, parts of life to get together. And it's a very focused effort to get them to make a whole bunch of games within a very concentrated period of time. So it's more designed for like left of field non-traditional games. You're not going to find someone making, you know, Super Mario Brothers when they get to the critical hit program. It's more uh, about, you know, more experimental side of things. There's one game uh, that uh, Hamish worked on, I think, where you just sat, li you lie down in a tent and you just looked up and oh, you no. interacted with Oh, maybe it's another game that's like, because he also has one where it's like the tree, it's like yeah. moving and it's like slowly growing. Yeah, yeah, like over the course of however many months you, you, uh, you're you in the program for, you make like something like six to ten games, you, uh, just a lot of little stuff that you build up over the course of those times to get experience to understand how it works, you know. The, the most important thing there is just to get a lot of experience, you know, make more than one game. Work on something, stop, move on to the next thing, you know, take what you learned from the last part, move it on to this one, and keep going, going, going. So that one's good, and uh, when it's open, you can always try applying. Same thing for Pixels, the incubator program. There's a lot of different options, and meetups actually too around here in Montreal. There's one, uh, the uh, MRGS, uh, Montreal Gaming Society, that meets up on the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, what they do normally is it's a get together at a cafe. I think it might be Cafe Arter uh, by Park Metro, and. Um, what they'll do is they'll get together, they'll present little stuff that they're working on, they might have a game jam, uh, they'll, there's going to be a lot of programmers and designers within the industry just hanging out and talking, so if you want to meet other people and see what's going on in the industry here, what's happening at the Montreal scene, you can go and check it out. A lot of cool stuff happening, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Cool. If you have any questions, feel free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm curious, what, what was the first uh, game engine you used? Or? I've dabbled a bit in Game Maker. I made something with that. <laughs> it barely qualifies as a game. <laughs> it's pretty embarrassing, and I'm going to keep that to myself. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's like a sketchbook, you know? You'll, you'll work on little things and just like doodle and play around with a couple things every now and then, but until you're ready to show something, you're you're gonna just keep working on that little thing, yeah, you know. That makes sense. But would you say it was like a good experience? Yeah, yeah, very helpful because it got me understanding like what it takes to make a game. You know, the kind of things that you have to think about and prepare beforehand instead of just diving in and be like, I want to make the character move. Oh wait, no, not not that way. What about about that way? Maybe maybe not. What if? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Osman? Oh no, oh, I was no? raising my hand. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I was wondering like in your experience, like how much. How many games did you have to make, or did you have to just like dabble with before you actually like sit down and just say, okay, I think now that like, this thing I think is worth money, like I can sell this. Okay, uh, there has been a very very interesting graphic that's been going around talking about the Angry Birds game, so it kind of documents the progress of how they got to that point. So it starts off with three people, uh, friends, buddies getting together deciding to start a game company. 
So they've already had experience making games. Maybe they studied at school. Maybe they're working in other places. And they you know, have hundreds of hours, thousands of hours, maybe like tens of thousands of hours collectively on making games. And they decided to make a company. They made something around 50 games that all failed and nearly got them broke. And then out of one you know, doodle, one little game idea that one of the guys had, they ended up with Angry Birds which we know now of like a multi-million dollar churning machine with a movie coming out soon, somehow. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's the kind of thing where it's going to take a while, it's going to take a lot of games, it's not going to happen on your first go, it's not going to happen on your tenth go, it might happen on your hundredth, uh, like hundredth, you know? Just make a lot of games. That's it. I've kind of heard the same thing from also the maker of uh, Super Meat Boy and The Binding of Isaac, mm -hmm. where he has a huge backlog of games that no one has ever heard of. Yep. Yeah, and even before that, he's added other stuff that he's done on Newgrounds and posted there and you know messed around with so before he got to the point where he made Super Meat Boy. You know, it, It's just the kind of thing where we can't really um, take a look at all these successes and be like, oh, it's easy. Because we only see the successes. We don't see all the failures. We don't see, you know, we only see the tip of the iceberg when there's like 9,000 other games that were made and destroyed before they got to the point where, like, Meat Boy actually jumps and it feels right, you know. It takes a while. It takes a long time. Well, I guess I, I would also recommend if anyone's interested the uh, indie game in the movie. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. It's good. It's good. It sets up a narrative, though, that you know, mostly white male uh, dudes make games, and they devote a lot of their life to it, and then they end up successful somehow. But you know, it, it does paint a picture of what it's like in the indie game scene. There's a whole bunch of other documentaries there. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is more on sort of the technical side, I guess, because mm -hmm. obviously I have like zero knowledge in indie game. Um, when you were talking about the art, in, like art and animation, um, doesn't matter like which software we end up using to create like that animation to add into our games. Are those things that you that can export, like let's say in a GIF or something, and then be able to import into one of those games? Yeah, like for example, with uh, Pixel Edit that I use, I can export a GIF of an animation. I can even scale it up when I export it. So if I want it like at five times the resolution, five times bigger, I can just type in five, and then it punches up to five times the size. So as long uh, as you know how to like, code it into those games. Yeah, well, I mean, like, like from whatever program you use, you can export it into the format that you want, either on a sprite sheet or single images or animations. And then depending on the program, you could probably import any of the three or all three, you know? So take a look at the restrictions and the, the limitations of the program that you're using. You know, does it only want things in sprite sheets? Can you get away with animations? Can you, you know, if you're working on a visual novel, let's just have like one big image, and then you're working in Photoshop, so you draw like the different emotions of the characters on different layers, and then you export the different layers as different files. So you can get the program to point to, okay, now that character's happy, now sad, now angry, now flirty, you know. So you can draw like, in Pixel, like really small, and then just blow it up, is it like bitmap, or is it uh, vectors? It's, it's bitmap. It's, it's a raster image that you're doing, but it's just so small, that you, you don't have any, uh, there's a, uh, I always forget if it's anti-aliasing or aliasing. Anti. Anti, okay. Aliasing simulates the. Exactly, so that, that smooths it out, that rounds it up, blurs it a little bit, so yeah. So with it being anti-alias, you're just dealing with corners, edges, okay. you know, so when you scale it up, it's not gonna try and figure out, okay, like yeah. that's gonna be like a gray thing in between. It's either, either one or the other. Yeah? Aliasing is pixel. It's the other way around. No. One of the two. I always forget. <laughs> Very confusing. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. That. <laughs> yeah. That is. What did I use again? I don't. I don't know. I went on. Uh, just to Google Drive and use it, so it might as well be the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so Should we usually use YouTube Hot? <laughs> <laughs> Should we use YouTube Hot? Yeah. 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 Yeah.